You are about to listen to a message by Apostle Joseph Minter. Apostle Joseph Minter is the head pastor and leader of Torch World Ministries, an all-encompassing network of ministries. Through his teachings of the Word, healing, deliverance and declarations, the power of God has transformed many lives. Now the Word of God. With Moses in the school of intimacy. Their hearts were burning, but they didn't know him. Their eyes were still restrained. Their hearts were burning. Your heart can be burning in church. Your heart can be burning reading the book. You can read the book and you are child. You are inspired. You can listen to a message and you are child. When you sit down with the things you have read and you sit down alone and you begin to engage the teacher and he's breaking your brain. That is one true encounters. That's the, the place of true encounters. When he becomes your teacher. That is when your eyes open and then you know. There's, there's a realm you get to where you encounter him. Father, we thank you this morning for this privilege. Even as we're coming to listen to your word, we pray that you will help us to open our hearts to receive your word. Let your word fall on our hearts as a seed that will bear fruit, that will abide. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. We thank God for, for today. You're welcome to church this morning. Um, today is 7th August. 20. Is it 7th or 8th? 7th. 7th. Okay, yeah. So 7th August 2022. And uh, today I'm talking on with Moses in the school of intimacy. Oh, man of God, you're welcome. Let's let's welcome Pastor Kofi. Yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. With Moses in the school of intimacy. With Moses in the school of intimacy. That's what I'm talking about today. And uh, last week we saw that the next major thing after salvation is consecration. And so we saw that we have salvation, consecration, and then ministry. In other words, uh, outer court, holy place, and holy of holies. And so then we saw also that um, on the part of consecration of the, of the king priest, you know, there are about seven stops or seven, seven schools or if you like, seven courses or stations on the path of consecration of the king priest. And we saw that God is going to teach you these seven things as you work with God. The first one is intimacy. Intimacy. And the intimacy is to help you develop a strong personal relationship with the Lord. That is going to be the bedrock or the foundation of everything that God will ever do with you. Then the second school is the school of faith that will ensure that you grow in the knowledge of God. Uh, not in the head knowledge, but in the experiential knowledge that you grow to know him. He takes you through the school of faith. And the third one is the school of sanctification to develop character and endurance. And we saw that that is what is going to be achieved in that school, character and endurance. And the next school is the school of stewardship to overcome mammon. To overcome mammon. God is going to take you into the school of stewardship and teach you how to be a good steward so that you can overcome God's number one enemy who is mammon. And the school of authority will also teach us spiritual warfare. Um, spiritual warfare. The, 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 the kind of... Uh, the Bible says that he, he trains our hands and then for war, and our fingers for battle. That's the God that we serve. And so spiritual warfare is part of the believer's life. At the school of love, to learn, to train you to learn how to grow with others. It's not enough to grow. You must learn how to grow with others. Uh, Till we all arrive at the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to the measure of the stature of Christ. So we all. Then other scriptures also say that 
that we may be able to comprehend with, the, with all saints the length and the breadth, the depth and the height of the love of Christ. And then the school of ministry to know our unique path of consecration and our unique instructions to, to work with in, in, the, in, the, in the path of destiny. Now, these schools are spiritual schools, not, not physical schools. They are spiritual schools, and they represent God's pattern of growth and development for the believer. Last week, I said, let me repeat, I said, your salvation does not benefit God. Your salvation does not benefit God. It benefits you. It is your dominion that benefits God. So your dominion brings glory to God. God is not enthused. When you become born again, God is not enthused. Bible did, didn't say that God rejoices when a sinner is, is born again. It's the angels who rejoice in the presence of God. But God, God already knew that you'd be born again. So that's, I mean, it's no big deal to him. Okay, but your, your dominion, what you do with the new birth, that is what brings glory to God. Okay, and then we also saw that God gives the seed. So when you receive seed, it does not impress God. You can't impress God with the seed you have, with the gifts you have. God, they all came from him. What, you can, what, what, what God looks forward to from you is the fruit. So the seed does not glorify God, but the fruit glorifies God. Then we also realize that um, when you become born again, God puts you on the pathway of the kingdom and his righteousness. And the word righteousness simply means alignment. So God seeks alignment in us so that we can attain oneness with him. The goal, the goal is oneness with God. When you become born again, you are one in spirit. 1 Corinthians 6, 17, he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. But God puts us on this path to attain oneness in all other areas of our lives so that we can be just like him in all other areas. By the time you come to maturity, we are talking about oneness, oneness. But the pathway to oneness is the path of righteousness. And righteousness Please do something about the volume. Righteousness simply means right alignment. You are in alignment with him. So as you walk on that path, he's bringing you to alignment. Now, your spirit is in alignment with him. A time comes when your emotions will be in alignment with him. Where um, what breaks his heart will break your heart. What gladdens his heart will gladden your heart. And like I always say, if you were with Jesus when the woman was caught in adultery, what would, be, what would have been your reaction? Would you have joined those who were condemning him, her or you would have joined Jesus in restoring her? When we get to that level where we attain oneness, we'll be like Jesus. The other question is, if you were there when people were selling and buying in the temple, would you have taken, would you have sided with Jesus who took whips and went into the temple and drove them all out, or you would have said, no, let's take our time. People need space to grow. You see, so if you are one with Jesus, you will see that these emotions in the temple, you will be angry when they were selling in the temple. But when, you, when he met the woman in adultery, caught in adultery, you will share the same emotions with him. So oneness is when we get to a place where we become like him. That's the purpose. The end of our Christian journey is to attain oneness with Christ on this earth. So that we can see from his perspective. We can minister from his perspective. We can do things from his perspective because we are one with him. When you attain oneness, you think like him. You become one in your aspiration. You become one in your thinking. You have the heart of the father. And then the heart of the father is what is going to regulate your conduct and your lifestyle. The prodigal son had the property of the father, but he didn't have the heart of the father. So you can have the blessings of God 
without having his heart. It's possible. It's possible. That's why sometimes God can bless people and then you realize that the blessing is fighting against God. Instead of, instead of helping them to serve God better, the blessing will start fighting against God. Because you can receive blessing and still not have his heart. Okay, so this part of righteousness, there are two kinds of righteousness in scripture. The first one is what we call the gift of righteousness. The gift of righteousness is in Romans 5, 17, where the Bible says that uh, through one man, one man's offense, you know, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Now, this gift of righteousness is freely given to the believer. You don't work for it. It was given to you when you accepted Christ. You, you didn't work for it. You were made righteous. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21 says that um, he who knew no sin, uh, he made him sin, that we should become the righteousness of God in him. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin. Jesus was turned into sin. He didn't sin, but he was made sin. You know, and if it was perfectly okay for God to take his righteous, innocent son and convert him to sin, then it's also okay for God to take filthy, dirty sinners and declare them not guilty. That is the mean of the gift of righteousness. Now, that is the, the free gift, the first, the first stage of righteousness. But after God has clothed you with that, with that robe, then he puts you on the path of righteousness, the path of alignment, where he begins to work his will into your life, where practically, practically, you, you are on the path of attaining oneness with him. And that one is not the gift of righteousness. That one is the path of righteousness. Now, uh, you, will see, you will see that with that one, there's a price to pay. The second rope is not free. You have to pay a price. And the price you have to pay is to be on that path, to be on that journey with God. In the Bible, you will see, you will see that when you get to Revelation 3, it says that I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in fire and white garments and anoint your eyes with eyes out. Buy from me gold, refine the fire, that you may be rich. And why garments? This garment he said buy. You have to buy. This one is not free. And you don't buy with money. It's not, the buy here is not in monetary terms. The buy here is talking about the collaborative effort that you must put in to grace, for grace to result into glory. The, 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 the journey starts with grace and faith, but the journey ends with glory. Grace is never the end of the journey. It's the beginning. That's why it's free. But he puts you on that path of growth. So sometimes you will see in the life of a believer, you will see God can be speaking to you this way. And then as you go along, then you see that God is speaking to you this way. And sometimes you, know, you won't understand. If you don't understand that, there, there, are, there are levels. For instance, for instance, the Bible says things like, if anyone does not take care of his own family, he is worse than an infidel. Husbands, love your wives. Wives, submit to your husbands. But the Bible also says something like, if anyone will come after me, let him hate his wife hate his children, and hate himself. Otherwise, you can't come after me. All these scriptures, both of them are true. They are true. So, one is saying that, now, it's teaching you the rudiments of love. So, you love. But the other is saying that, as you are growing, the love you have for God, it will make the love you have for man look like hatred. And a time will come where the love you have for man 
will conflict with love we have for God. And that is when God will ask you to choose me or choose man. Simon Peter, do you love me more than this? Lovest thou me more than this? There's a stage you get to in your Christian life. That, that's that place of maturity where God, where, where God will let you know that he's a jealous God. That you can't love me and love mammon at the same time. You can't claim to be following me or trusting me and put your trust in the arm of flesh at the same time. It's all part of the, the growth process and the alignment. So the journey starts with grace and faith. We are saved by grace through faith and both are free gifts. The faith to believe in Jesus was a free gift. Ephesians 2 verse 8 to 9 talks about that. Then it says that for by grace you have been saved through faith and that's not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Now, when you less, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Talking about our salvation, nobody played any role, any part in salvation. Now go to Romans 4.16. Uh, let me show you something. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace. It is of faith that it might be according to grace. Anything that is of faith, is the, the starting point is grace. It's of faith that it might be according to grace. It's of faith, not of works, that it might be according to grace. So that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Okay, now, so the journey starts with grace and faith. Then he puts you on the path of righteousness and the journey ends in glory. So it's not only about grace, it's also about glory. Uh, Psalm 84 verse 11, the Lord will give grace and glory. It's a journey like that. The Lord will give you grace. The Lord will give grace and glory. Romans chapter 5 verse 1 to 5. You will see the whole journey there. Romans 5, verse 1 to 5. The whole journey from grace to glory is captured in Romans 5, 1 to, 1 to 5. Therefore, having been justified by what? Faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ and through whom we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Hope is in the future. So we stand in grace by faith and then we make a practical journey into glory. So you, you know, you know, and you see the grace of God is so, um, so vast, so, so awesome. You can spend your entire Christian life at the grace level and never touch the glory realm. Never touch oneness in reality. You can only touch oneness only in the fact that you have been reconciled with Christ and you are righteous. You are God's righteousness. But righteousness as in seek ye for the kingdom and his righteousness. That righteousness is not the gift of righteousness. This was talking about what I call structural righteousness. Where you have been constituted to be in alignment with him. Your thinking is like him. Where God can say things like, if so and so is there, I don't need to bother myself. Because so and so can represent me fully. That is maturity. That is oneness. I'm talking about oneness. Okay, so these schools I've just outlined, they are not in linear progression. So it's not as if God will finish teaching you intimacy and after that take you to faith and move you to still worship. No. The same time, the same time God is teaching you intimacy, he's teaching you faith, stewardship, ministry, everything at the same time. But you see, when you go to the next level, the, the course content will, will, will be deeper. So it's like now at the first level, he's teaching you the rudiments of intimacy. He's still requiring you to, to work in faith. He's still training you to be sanctified. He's still training you to be a steward. But as you progress, you will see that the course content increases. 
it's, it's very much like our, our normal school, I mean, education that we have. You will see that it is just the basics you have been dealing with all your life. The ABC they taught you at nursery, all the complex uh, words in English you can pronounce, they are just various combinations of ABC, the 26 letters of the alphabet. You can't do anything beyond the 26 letters in English. So, but now, now where you are, they are not teaching you two letter words, are they? They taught you some time ago as a stepping stone, a platform. That, that's not where you were meant to dwell. When they were teaching you one plus one is equal to one, and then the teacher will beat you when you get it wrong. Now you, you look back and you, you, it's even funny to you. How one plus one, you, 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 you could get it wrong. Somebody was telling me that. He said, at first, these two were used to confuse him. How and who? And then was and saw. He said, when you are young, these things can come. Now, those words do not confuse him anymore. Is that the course content has changed. Now, you don't just need uh, two-letter words. Now, they've taught you how to construct a sentence. They've taught you tenses. They've taught you verbs, pronouns. And even to, I mean, higher degree, then they will start teaching you how to even write passages, composition, how to read, understand, and answer questions, comprehension, all these things, construction. They, were, they, they taught us all these things as a foundation. So you see, so the course content, they, 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 they differ. It increases as you go along. Now, but intimacy with God, I can say is the bedrock. In other words, that looks more like the, the universal set and all the other schools are in it. Because you will need it not only at the first stage, even at the very last stage of your Christian life, you will still be needing more intimacy with God. God has said that. God is so deep. Only shallow people think they know him enough. God is so deep that only shallow people think they know God enough. One, one sign that you, you always know that you are growing in the Lord is that you never arrive. That is one sign. Anytime you get the mind that I've arrived, I've finished, it means the next thing is you, have to, you are going to die. Paul said, I've finished my course. I've fought the good fight. I've kept the faith. Now, the next thing is to wait for the crown of righteousness. He was, he was about to die. Paul, at the end of his ministry, was still crying that I may know him. And the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable to his death. This same Paul, Paul, he had been doing ministry for a lot of years. And he said that, I mean, Philippians was written in prison. When he had been ministering, walking around, you know, and then doing other things, God said, look, you need to write some books. The way you are busy, you, if I don't tie you down, you, there's no way you write those books, so go to prison. And God, God, God arranged for Paul to be arrested and be in prison. And from prison, he wrote more books than he wrote when he was walking around. It was in prison that he was shouting, rejoice. I say to you all, rejoice, Philippians, in prison. It was in prison that he was saying, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory. That, the person that said that scripture, he was saying it from prison. And their prison is not like our prison. It was a dungeon. So intimacy with God is something you will need even at the tail end of your journey. There are things we never outgrow. Even in physical life, there's, there will not come a point where you don't need water. Now you may not need lactogen or SMA or breast milk. How many of you still need breast milk? You don't need breast milk. 
You don't need lactogen. You don't need um, SMA. You don't need baby food. You, don't, you, you needed them some time back. But now, so that, that food was given to you uh, according to your age to help you grow. Now you don't need them anymore. But for water, you needed water when you were a child and you will still need water when you are old. Water is like intimacy with God. You will never outgrow it. The day, the day you outgrow it, know that that will be the beginning of the end of you. The day you outgrow your need for God on a daily basis, on a second to second basis. So it is, it is more like the universal set and all these others are subsets within that, that, that big bracket. And working with God can be compared to the process of refinery. I did some little research and I realized that there are many, many products. Uh, they said over 6,000 items are made from petroleum waste byproducts. Over, sorry, 6,000 items. Over 6,000 items. As, 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 as they go through, you see, crude oil, as it goes through refinery, there are so many products that can be produced. And they gave examples at fertilizer, perfumes, insecticide, petroleum jelly, you know, Vaseline, that, that, that Vaseline type, um, soap, etc. But the main goal may not be those things. Those are byproducts. Our work with God, the main goal is glory, oneness. But as you spend time with God, and as you follow God, you will see things like faith, growth, growth in faith, growth in character, growth in authority, growth in love, growth in stewardship. These are byproducts of a consistent work with God, byproducts. But the main goal is glory, to come to a place where you are one with him. A place where you can fully represent him. But the byproducts are all these things I've mentioned. They are byproducts. Power is a byproduct. When a person begins to spend time with God in prayer and fasting, it is likely that he will step into power. But power is not the goal. It's likely he will move in a dimension of anointing. But that is not the goal. The goal is oneness. But these are byproducts. Ministry is an overflow. Overflow of that journey. It's also a byproduct. It's an overflow. The journey is to get to a point where you will be God's man, God's woman, at God's appointed place, doing God's will, in God's way. That's why Abraham never said, that is the Lord. And the Bible called him a prophet. In fact, the first person to be called a prophet was Abraham. Genesis 20 verse 7. And he never said, that says the Lord. Never said it. But he had become God's prophet. He had attained oneness with God. So God, God would say things like, can I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? That one is not anointing. It's not gifting. Can I hide from Abraham? God is saying that I can't just bypass Abraham and do what I want to do. Because now he has attained oneness with me. That's why when he got to that point, that is why when Abimelech took Sarah, the Bible says immediately all the ladies in the house, their wounds were closed. Because when we get to the place of oneness, that is when judgment and vengeance comes to people who even try to trivialize our work with God. That's when God invests his jealousy in you. It's higher than anointing. Higher than giftings and power. Those things are byproducts. Higher than ministry. Ministry is a byproduct. It's not the, the main thing. Ministry is a byproduct. The end of the journey is oneness. 
So today we are going to into the school of intimacy. I, I don't know whether you can see from here. Okay. And the course instructor for today is the man called Moses. So the topic is with Moses in the school of intimacy. And why Moses? Because Moses in the Bible is the one that truly represents intimacy with God. I'll give you why, the reasons. But let me first of all say that most of the Old Testament characters were models and templates for various things in God. Their lives were used as models and templates, prophetic templates. Do you know why Job was going through all that he went through? It was not to say that that is how God is. The, the, the aspect of God's nature, that the, the, the problems of Job was meant to portray and capture is God's mercy and compassion. And we see that in, in, in James, in James chapter 5 verse 11, you will see that all that Job went through, he said, indeed we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the intended, the end intended by the Lord. The Lord is very compassionate and merciful. So Job's life was used to paint the picture of God's love and compassion. You know, we think that Job's life is telling us that God is wicked. Look at, look at the Bible's interpretation. The way, the, 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 see, the Old Testament, the New Testament explains the old. The new gives life to the old. It explains the old. And so in the New Testament, we are seeing why Job went through. Say, the, the, the end intended by the Lord was that the law is very compassionate and merciful. It wasn't about Job at all. It was about the Lord himself. So we can look at Job and understand God's passion, God's compassion and mercy. We can look at Abraham and study something about faith. You can't talk about faith and skip Abraham, the father of faith. You can't talk about encounters and skip Jacob. Jacob is a template for encounters in the Bible. Because if you look at how he, the encounter he had with God, the only person who had power with God and man, he struggled with God and prevailed. Okay? You can't talk about authority and skip David. Because David did for authority what Abraham did for faith. And the only person who could build a throne for the Messiah to sit on the throne, as I'm speaking, is David. The angel told Mary, he said, God will give him the throne of his father David. So there was something about authority that David knew and did that created that spiritual DNA for leadership and kingdom in the life of Jesus Christ. Then we come to Moses. The man Moses was the only person in the Bible that the Bible said God knew him face to face. Deuteronomy 34 verse 10. And the Bible did not say Moses knew God face to face. It said God knew Moses face to face. And the two are different. But since then, there has not arisen in Israel a prophet like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. Now, face to face is the highest level of intimacy. Face to face. I see your face, you see my face. When you listen to the message I preached on looking into his face in 2017, you will understand. I preached the message on looking into his face. That face to face is the highest level of intimacy that we have. And Moses, God knew him face to face. You can claim that you know God. But this one is not saying Moses knew God. He said God knew him. You can, you can, you can think that you know God and God may not even know you. <laughs> he said, Lord, have we not 
Did we not cast out devils in your name? They called him Lord. Why? They knew him. Or they thought they knew him. Have, have we not preached wonderful messages in your name? Why did they do that? Because they thought they knew him. That was ministry. But he said, I never knew you. So, we can choose Moses because it was God who said, I know this man face to face. It wasn't Moses that was bragging. I know God. <laughs> I have his number. That's why he said, I know him. You know, you can brag that you know somebody. The best way not even know you. Like somebody went for a funeral and said, Ah, I quit with you. I have no two for your power. Hey, me no two. Hey, me no two for ya. Hey, ya pa. Me no two for. Meanwhile, you don't know two for. So Moses, number two, Moses. God revealed His name to Moses. Exodus six verse two. What God did not tell Abraham, He told Moses. And God spoke to Moses and said to him, "I am the Lord. I am the Lord." Okay, yeah, continue. I appear to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, but my, by, by my name, Lord, I was not known to them. That name, Lord, is the word YHWH. YHWH, which we in the English say Yahweh. There are no vowels in the Hebrew language, only consonants. But when there's an adumbration into the English, there were insert vowels, Jehovah, Yahweh. The A and the E are not part of the original Hebrew. That name was revealed to Moses. And if you know something about names, a name is not just a matter of nomenclature. A name is a matter of identity. Matter of status. Matter of nature, matter of function, a name. It's not just nomenclature, identity, status, nature, and function. So the early the, 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 the patriarchs in the in the in the Bible, they knew God by his names. Whenever God revealed himself, an aspect it will be captured in the name. And Abraham called the place Jehovah Jireh. Why? Because it was a place he got to where he encountered God as a provider. Where he realized that God sends provision ahead of obedience. Jehovah Jireh. And Moses named the altar Jehovah Nisi. That was when God revealed that he was a man of war. Jehovah our banner, our insignia, our flag. The one who goes before us in battle. It was revelation. So you see, the, the, how deep you know God is determined by the revelation of his names. Not the names in the Bible. But maybe you can know him as savior. But have you experienced him as provider? Have you experienced him as protector? Have you experienced him as healer? Have you experienced him as Lord? Have you experienced him as your bridegroom? These are various aspects of God. Have you experienced him as a judge? You can, it, it will surprise you, you see, you can know God as your bridegroom, your lover, and you are sharing sweet talks with him in a secret place. When you are appearing before him as judge, you'll be surprised. It's as if you don't even know him because there he's in a different posture, different disposition altogether. It's as if one way and then you will, you will vanish. So when we say, for instance, Esther in the Bible, Esther was the wife of Ahasuerus. The wife that she was with him in his bedroom, the queen. And yet a time came that she was approaching the court and Esther had to go and Ahasuerus had to stretch a scepter to Esther. Her life hung in the balance. She could be killed. If the king had refused to touch or stretch the scepter to her, 
The same person in the bedroom, when she was going to the court of the king, she had to go through protocol. That's how God is. So at one point, he may be your bridegroom telling you, I love you. I love you. At another point, he's your army commander saying, charge. Say, move. And as you grow, God will begin to reveal aspects of his nature to you. So you can see people talking about God according to how they have experienced him. No conflict at all. Okay. So then God also revealed his blueprint for intimacy and relationship to Moses. And that was a tabernacle. The tabernacle was the blueprint of God for intimacy. I don't know how many teachings I've done using the tabernacle. Many teachings. And today too, I'm going to use the tabernacle. Yes. And all different, different, different things. We can talk about the tabernacle. You are talking about spirit, soul, body. The tabernacle. Spirit, soul, body. Because man was created as a tabernacle, as a temple of God. The outer court is your body. Holy place is your soul. Holy of holies is your spirit. Jesus is the tabernacle. The outer court was called the way. Holy place was called the truth. Holy of holies was called the life. That's Jesus. In fact, I, I can take you to the tabernacle. Every article was pointing to Christ. Everything. Including the funny thing, including the nail that fastened the covering to the ground. That nail, that peg. Isaiah 22 talked about that. And the reason why God said, don't drive the nail all through down. Because the, the, the one that the nail represents, he will not, the earth will not keep him. He will resurrect. So don't, don't drive it through. Don't hit the nail till it goes down. You call, don't bury it. Let it go just halfway. Please, the sound. Let it go just halfway. And all these instructions were given to Moses. He was the one that God used to unveil all these things. So I'm going to go to the board. And I'm going to take you on a little journey. Okay. Now, this whole journey of intimacy with God is supervised by a spirit called the spirit of grace and supplication. Those are the twin spirits of intimacy. You see, the spirit of God is made up of many twin spirits. Isaiah 11 verse 2. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. That's the twin spirit of light. The spirit of counsel and might. Twin spirit of power. The spirit of knowledge and the fear of God. Twin spirits of purity. And Zechariah 12 verse 10. The spirit of grace and supplication. Twin spirit of intimacy. And I preach a message on the spirit of grace and supplication. You can check that one too out. I spent time talking about, talking about these two spirits. Now, these are the spirits that are responsible to oversee the journey of our intimacy with God. They are responsible for the supply of spiritual hunger and holy holy dissatisfaction. The twin spirits of intimacy, they are the ones who supply spiritual hunger. When that spirit touches you right now, you will start mourning, you will start weeping. Not literal weeping. You will start mourning your present condition, which means that your spirit will be yearning for a deeper intimacy with God. When, that, when these two spirits are work, at work in your life, your condition that you have become so comfortable with, that you think you are okay, you are doing well, you, you, they, they create more room, more space in your spirit. More room for improvement. That, 
It is these two spirits that helps us to be crying, Abba, Father, all the time. Abba, Father is a groan. Abba, Father. Abba, Hupata. It's not a statement, it's a groan. You know that our spirits are groaning in our bodies. When you become born again, the Bible says your spirit is groaning in your body because the spirit is, is, I mean, the spirit wants to get out of this body. The spirit feels trapped in this body. Your full potential is always growing within you. Because this body limits us from expressing our full potential. Do you know what is inside of your spirit? Yes. This, do, see, listen. Moses and co, all that they experienced with God, all that Moses saw, the glory of God, the cloud, the smoke, all that now is in our spirits as new creation. But our bodies are what is limiting us. That's why we can't get the expression they, they had. They work with the Father, with God himself. We are working with the Holy Spirit and he lives in us and he can be quenched. Yes, he can be quenched. The Holy Spirit can be limited. He, you can literally mute him, mute him, quench him. So our spirits are always groaning. Second Corinthians 5.10, uh, 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 chapter 5 verse 1 coming. It says our spirit, we are groaning in this body. We want, we want to be further clothed. The same way the earth also is groaning. The earth is groaning, waiting to be delivered. Romans chapter 8 verse, verse, verse 19 downward. The, 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 the earth is groaning to be delivered from the bondage of corruption. And the Holy Spirit too is groaning within us. So anytime we pray in tongues, when the Spirit is groaning, what is creating is that I, I want a deeper intimacy. I, I, want, I want something deeper. So only eternity can accommodate our potential. Only eternity. That's why we see when, when you leave this body, your spirit will you that, that, that's your true self. You will discover your true self. Unlimited. So these two spirits, they release spiritual hunger. Spiritual hunger creates a passionate pursuit which finds expression primarily through a desire to spend time with God. Spiritual hunger. And that hunger is furnished by the spirit of grace and supplication. It creates that hunger that wants you, wants you to, I mean, wants you that you always want to spend time with God. And when you spend time with God, it leads to encounter. And encounter leads to convictions. So the cycle of intimacy is like this. It's a cycle. Okay? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cycle and a cycle as well, so that you don't know a time. Okay, I don't even know where it started from. But the starting point is the spirit of grace and supplication will give birth to spiritual hunger. And spiritual hunger will manifest in pursuit. You will start pursuing him. You will start desiring more of him. Okay? Spiritual hunger will lead to pursuit. And that this pursuit is the desire to be with him, spend time with him. It will give birth to encounters. Now, these encounters, they give birth to convictions. Convictions are, are they are conclusions you arrive at based on the revelation of God in scripture and personally to you. They are convictions. You can get to a point in your Christian life because of the revelation of scripture and encounters 
Nobody can talk you out of certain things. Because it will not be by head knowledge that which we have, we have seen, we have heard, our hands have what? Handled. First John 1 John 1.1 That which we have seen, that which we have heard, that which our, our hands have handled. At that point, it's not about my pastor said. It's not about so and so said. Now, you have come to a point where you have built conviction. When you get to that point, that's where you know God. Knowing God is just talking about convictions you have built over the period, out of the word and out of encounter, through the word and the spirit. So you see that this is a, a, a cycle and also a circle. Now, when you are growing, you see another bigger circle. Okay, so the spirit of grace and supplication, they will supply more hunger and the more hunger will lead to a hotter pursuit. A hotter, a hotter pursuit, which is the desire to, oh, okay, this is the spirit, this is the, the hunger, more hunger, then the hotter pursuit. Then it will lead to deeper encounters and lead to stronger convictions. Then you are moving on in the journey. Then the spirit of grace and supplication will come again, pull you again, give you more hunger. Okay? Then greater pursuit. Then more deeper encounters. Then even stronger convictions. It's like that till you leave this world. So if you work with God, you will see that you, you will always have diff, several endings and several beginnings. Because the work of God is not just one stretch, it's in phases. A time will come where you will see that God will draw you and put you on another dimension and you will be a child in that dimension. And then he will lead you to navigate through that dimension and then even just when you think you have you have mastered this level, then the spirit of grace and supplication will come again. And they will pull you, I mean, pull you back and put you on another, another cycle. That's why Paul said that I may know him. That's why I say that the sign that you are growing is the feeling that you have not arrived. That is one sign that you are growing in the Lord. That's why people who are committed to God in this work, they remain broken and humble. Because the more, you see, the closer you get to God, the more you know you don't know him. The more you know that you don't, you don't know him. And so, so all that you will cry for is mercy. Help me. I don't know you. I, I thought I knew you. I don't know you. Have mercy on me. Just, just help me. This journey, only your mercy can help me to, to, to finish. Because I thought I had mastered all the keys and all the points, all the buttons to press and to point. But then I get to a point and say, no. This aspect of you, I never knew. Job said, I've heard you by the hearing of the ears, but now my eyes see you. The spirit of grace and supplication. That's what they do. So, the number one key to a sustained relationship with God is hunger. If there's any prayer that we must pray, we must pray never to stop being hungry for God. The day your hunger for God subsides, that's the day that you are going down. When, you see, you get to a point where in your Christian life you feel dissatisfied. You feel some kind of discontentment. It's like your spirit is agitated. And, and you begin to ask yourself, have I, have, I, have I done anything wrong? Why am I feeling this? Some restlessness. You feel like you have plateaued. 
like you have the, all the things have become routine. Business as usual. That's the place where the spirit of grace and supplication is creating more capacity in your spirit. Because from there, you will see another realm, another dimension coming. Sometimes you will ask yourself, I've been praying, I've been reading my Bible, I've been doing all these things, but I feel so dry. I don't feel, I don't feel God. <laughs> because it's a journey. So the tabernacle of intimacy, now uh, I'm going to draw the tabernacle, okay, and then I'm going to use it now. So the tabernacle was like this, three compartments, outer court, holy place, holy of holies. Okay, so let's say it's, it's more like a rectangle. Okay, now, <laughs> now outer court is the first compartment here. The outer court, to enter the outer court, there's a gate. I'm not talking about the gate. Okay. Then the next compartment, there's a door that will lead you to the next room, which is the holy place. Okay. Are you following? So we have the gate. Then we have the door. This door has five pillars. Two, three, four, five. This gate has four colors. Purple, blue, scarlet, white, which corresponds to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This one has five pillars, which corresponds to the fivefold ministry, which means that the holy place, talking about the church age. Now, to enter the holy of holies, we have the veil. The veil. So these are the three compartments. More like this room. So the outer core people are those who are <laughs> at the back. The sound and the media. Then the holy place people are you here. <laughs> then the holy of holies, me and Ken and, and mommy and, and Gloria and uh, Eric. We are holy place. If, if your feet does not touch this carpet, Please, you are not one of us. We know ourselves. We have, we have counted ourselves, please. <laughs> you see, Francis wants to step on the carpet. <laughs> now, in the outer court, there are two pieces of furniture. How many? Okay. The first thing you see is a very big altar. Very, very big altar. And it was made of bronze. It is called the bronze altar. This is where all the blood sacrifices were made. Every sacrifice that, that involved blood, it was placed on the bronze altar. After the bronze altar, then you go to a bowl. There's a bowl here. That bowl is full of water. It is called the lava. It was a basin full of water called the lava. That's where the priests had to wash before they enter the holy place. They had to wash their head, their feet, and their hands. Then, when you enter the holy place, there are three pieces of furniture in the holy place. Only three. Here, on your... Okay, this one is on the left, right? It's on the right, but this one, this picture is on the left. You have a table here, a table called the table of show bread. It has 12 loaves of bread, representing the 12 tribes of Israel. 12 loaves of bread on the table of show bread, representing the 12 tribes of Israel. This, these 12 loaves of bread, they were sprinkled with frankincense, and they stayed in the holy place for seven days. Every Sabbath, the priest would come and eat it. And there was also some glass, I mean, uh, cups of wine. 
they will pour the wine as sacrifice and eat the holy bread. This bread was holy bread. And it was 12, representing the 12 tribes of Israel. Then on your right, there is what do we call the golden candlestick. Okay, thank you. The golden candlestick on your right. Okay, so the, the, this golden candlestick, they are made up of seven, seven candles or seven lamps having one base. So it's one base and then it branches into seven lamps. Okay, and these represent the seven seven spirits of God. Seven spirits of God. In Isaiah 11 verse 2. Then, just before the veil, there is another altar. And this one, it is called the golden altar of incense. Beyond the holy place or beyond the outer court, there is no blood. There is no sacrifice for blood. Okay? But everything here is gold. All the blood sacrifice took place in the bronze altar, on the bronze altar. Then, between the holy place and the holy of holies was a thick curtain, very thick, very, very thick, separating the holy place from the holy of holies. This curtain was so thick, you could not tear it. But when Jesus Christ died, Bible says the temp, the, the curtain was torn, not from down to top, from top to down. For, from, for them to know that it was no human being who did it, it was torn from top to down. Because God was coming down. So, here, after the veil, then you go to the Holy of Holies. Now, the Holy of Holies has only one piece of furniture. The Ark of the Covenant. Now, very interesting. This Ark of the Covenant is very, very interesting. Very interesting. That was where God, God resided. The Ark was a throne. It was a throne. God sat in between the cherubim. There were two statues of angels called cher cherubim. And they were overlooking the, the Ark. At the two ends of the Ark were two angels... And they have sprouted their, their wings like this. And so their two wings were meeting. And under their two wings was a bowl. That bowl was called the mercy seat. It was, it was on top of the ark. It was called the mercy seat. It was called what? Okay. Now, the ark itself contained only three items. It contained the tablets of stone, the Ten Commandments. Then Aaron's rod, which sprouted flowers. And then a golden pot of manna that was kept as memorial. So these were the items in the ark. Okay. The, the tabernacle represents our journey. Our journey. So you will see Ah, uh, okay. Body, soul, spirit. Right? You see Egypt, wilderness, promised land. The, the whole journey, the tabernacle, is in three. In the outer court, you have obedience. You can write it down, obedience. I'm, I'm going to explain. Then you move to sacrifice. Then you move to oneness in the, in the Holy of Holies. Oneness. So you have grace. Grace through faith. Okay. Then here you have righteousness. Then in the holy place you have glory. 
it's, it's always a journey. A journey like that. A journey like that. Okay. The way. The truth. And life. Are you following? I, I just wanted to know that it represents our Christian life. Our Christian journey. In the outer court, you will have what I call ritualistic ritualistic intimacy ritualistic intimacy in the outer court so ritualistic intimacy in the holy place you have hunger induced hunger induced intimacy that's a progression in your journey of intimacy hunger induced intimacy then the, the Holy of Holies, you have oneness. Oneness. Ritualistic intimacy, what I mean by that is that at that point, you are just gaining your feet. You see, at that point, um, intimacy with God is restricted or let me say it's expressed through maybe having a daily devotion time with God, you know, all these things that that one they are rich was routine the end is not the routine the end is to get to a place where it is hunger induced like i always say in the outer court when you don't read your bible and pray you feel guilty in the outer court you feel guilty in the holy place you feel hungry When I say holy place, outer, I'm talking about a progression. Are you getting me? So when, when you start the journey, you will see that ritualistic intimacy is the thing is a ritual. I must get up and pray every morning. And then you do. It's supposed to help you develop the, the habit of going before God every morning. Because when you get to oneness, glory, you will still be doing it. But here in the outer court, at the start, that the starting point is more like ritualistic. It's more like routine. So when you don't pray or read your Bible, you feel guilty. You feel guilty. You have, 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 have done something wrong. I, I was supposed to read my Bible and pray. I didn't do it, so I feel guilty. So at this point in the, in the altar court, it's like you are doing it for God, not for yourself. And it has a feeling... That you are you go so you want to satisfy your conscience. That's why sometimes you 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 say, Okay, I will pray while going to work. But when you grow to the next level, it is hunger-induced intimacy. When you miss your time with the Lord, you feel so hungry. You feel hungry. You feel you you literally feel that you are hungry, that you skip bread. Yesterday, I was at the program, and a woman was sitting beside me. And the woman was struggling with, with her baby to feed him. The guy was very stubborn. The, the woman held him like that. Held him like that. You know, and then forced the thing into his mouth. And I said, this is a baby, that's why. When you grow, you, she will not have to force the thing into your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> she will not have to force the thing into your mouth. You will go for the food yourself. And the baby didn't see the need. Why the, the mother was worrying her, him like that? I mean, what is, what is, what, what is this? I'm, I, well, he wanted to play. He wanted, to, he wanted, him to, her to, uh, wanted the mother to put him down so that he would play around. But the mother too thought that or realized that. No, you eat in the morning. Now you must be hungry because of time. But the man, the, the small man, <laughs> the guy himself didn't know he was hungry. <laughs> you know. But when, when he grows, it will be hunger. He will, he will start feeling hungry. Nobody will tell you to go and eat. Even you will break fast. You, even fast that you are fasting, you will see that hunger is pulling you to go and break the fast. <laughs> uh, is that a witness in the house? <laughs> so, 
So the outer court represents the time of general dealings. Group dealings by the Lord. True intimacy starts when you are drawn. You, you will never really build a life of intimacy through group prayers. Group. It's not bad. There's a place for corporate prayer. But if you don't have a time that you spend alone, alone with God, it will not help you to grow in intimacy. So you see people organizing prayer meetings at a time when maybe you want to spend time with God. And many people think that by attending morning devotions in groups, you see, that one is just like church. You, you don't build intimacy really just by coming to church. No. No. That one is the general dealings of God. It's very important because we come to receive instruction and teaching and, and, and seed and all that. But real intimacy with God, where God takes you on a journey, he draws you to himself. He draws you. When he draws you, that is the beginning of the journey towards oneness. So it's like the group, all of us are in a group. Then you see that he's drawing you. So people will not understand you. When I say drawing you, I'm not trying to say that you are drawing you away from the group. He's drawing you to himself. So in the secret place, you will see that you, you will start loving, loving time that you spend alone with him too. So it's not enough to come to church and to join a prayer, prayer, prayer group. It's not enough to join a prayer group online. You must have your own time. You alone and God. If you don't have that, it means that you will stay in the outer court. You will stay at the, general, the place of general dealings for long. And real growth will never happen. Real growth will never happen. So, anybody could go to the outer court. Anybody. This place is, the, the outer court is a place of activity-oriented intimacy. Activity-oriented intimacy. Anybody could go to the outer court. The outer court is not deep enough. When you are in the outer court, listen, you cannot even be sure that what you are hearing is God. Because the son can also be speaking to you. You can, the son, the elements, because the outer court is exposed. If you don't go deep in your Christian life, you will not be able to distinguish between the voice of God and other voices. It's as you, as you go further that God trains you to know his voice. Do you know how you know a person's voice? Simple. Being with a person. That's, that's the key. They always say that the tallest man in a crowd is the one you love. The tallest man in a crowd. It's not the worthy. The tallest man in a crowd <laughs> is the one you love. <laughs> right now, right now, <laughs> you see, if let's say somebody who is short, <laughs> if, if you are in a relationship or you are married, eh, and then you enter, your lover, she will, she will see you. Even though you're not the tallest man. She will, she will just spot you where you are. Or you don't know that when you love somebody, you always know where the, the person is. When you are in a relationship or when you are, you are, you are now trying to get somebody. You will always know where the person sits. You know, when I had not, I had not started listening with my, 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 my wife, way back on campus, at that time, listen, 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 at that time, at that time, I had not yet proposed to her, but I was tracking her. <laughs> I, oh, yes. Do you know, do you know, I always spotted her when she entered the lecture room. 
because because we were doing one course together and it was a big hall and i will always look through to find where she was sitting <laughs> and, and you know something i managed to get the index number and i will check i will check her results for her and she, she didn't know <laughs> <laughs> confession time <laughs> what I'm trying to say is that the tallest man in the crowd is the one you love that's the one you can't miss you can't miss the person I get to so in a place of general dealings God deals with all of us generally you come to church the message comes generally but you know those who can really really benefit from the message it's those who, after here, take it again. Alone. Not the one you listen to in a group. No. That one, you miss many things. So, sometimes we think that when we, st- we, we, we are in a group, that is when, you know, we are growing. The group, the, the place for group is fellowship. That adds to your growth. But real intimacy will never happen in a group. If you marry and you are going for honeymoon, will you invite other people to come and join you? <laughs> oh, I know, Pastor, I know after you invite me. I, 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 I can. The way me and you are there, I know you invite me. <laughs> you, you, know, you, know, you know how difficult it is? So, intimacy takes place when you are separated. It's not, it doesn't take place where everybody is. No, no, it's God. That's why he draws you to himself. You know, sometimes what the things that happen to you sometimes that you think are negative, God, God used them to draw you to himself. I know somebody who became an intercessor because he was rejected by people. People will not receive him. I said, he said, let me turn my, my face to God. I'm talking about Bishop that he was knows. He said, when he started ministry, all the big, big people rejected him. He would go to this one, and the person would tell him, I don't sow among thorns. He would go to this one, and the person would tell him, look, God hasn't called you. Go to the medical field. God will not wait for you to finish medical school seven years and then call you to ministry. Go back. So, he didn't have friends. So he said he turned to God. That, is, that was when he, he developed the art of praying into God, into the spirit, like intercession. And that was, that was, that was how he, he progressed. Because if, let's say, that God was using that to drive him to secret place. There are many things that God can allow to drive you to him, secret place. There are some people, problems that they go through, that's when they started praying. That's when they really got to know God. Because when they were going through crisis and they didn't know where to turn and they turned to God and they started spending more time pouring out their heart. And you see, God has said that it doesn't matter what takes you to God. By the time you leave, something will happen to you. It doesn't matter what took Moses to the burning bush. He went there out of curiosity. What is this great sign? I will turn aside and see. It was God who was attracting Moses. When he got there, God said, Moses. So, there are many things in your work with God. There are many things that God will allow to happen in your life to drive you to him. Sometimes it will be rejection. Disappointment. There are all these things. Sometimes the devil can think that he's pushing you away. Not knowing that he's making you a candidate for the secret place. Because it will drive you back to a secret place. Then God will say, yes, I've gotten you. Let's begin the work. So the place of general dealings, that's not, that, that, that's not deep enough. It's not deep enough. Now, so then from there, as you enter the... Oh, uh, outer court. The first encounter is with the bronze altar. 
This one is a place of mercy. Mercy. Mercy is the first platform between God and man. Mercy. And do you know something? The interesting thing is that every stage to break into new realm, you will still need this same mercy and this same grace. This one, this one is grace. The lava is grace. The bronze altar is mercy. Grace and mercy. Mercy and grace. For sorry. Mercy and grace. They are the ones in the outer court. But the interesting thing is that you will still need them even at the highest level. You still need mercy and grace. They will never depart from you. Before you can reach God, the platform is mercy. Mercy here in the outer court is talking about the finished work of Christ. There can be relationship between God and man without what Christ did. Without God having mercy on humanity and allowing Christ to die. There was no platform, there was no relationship, no link between God and man apart from the what that Christ did. That is where mercy is. But you will still need the mercy. Anytime God wants you to have more of him, he gives you mercy first. He gives you mercy first. Paul said, God, by the mercy of God, he put me in the ministry. It's not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that shows mercy. That's why every stage of your life, you must know that you need mercy. Never depend on your strength. You can have first class. It's the mercy of God that can place you at a place where you, 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 you succeed in life. You can have money it is mercy. You, you can have your connections. It is mercy, the mercy of God that you need. Even physically in our lives, it's mercy. And in our spiritual journey too, it's mercy. Mercy is the platform of every level of experience and encounter you have with God. It, it is preceded by mercy. Hebrews 4 is still, let us come boldly to the throne of grace. That we will obtain, number one, mercy and then find grace to help in a time of need. So when you come before God, the first thing you obtain is mercy. Then grace comes to help. So in a, so in a work with God, mercy comes, then grace comes. Now, the mercy and grace will begin to, as we collaborate with these two spirits, the, the spirit of grace and supplication will provoke something that God will begin to draw you. You see that from the outer court, you are being drawn to a deeper, a deeper level, a deeper dimension with God. Now he's drawing you. It's like this. You can be a group of friends. Eh? Maybe three guys, maybe four ladies, friends. You are all going. Then the time comes. You see, one guy will draw one lady. You say, let's start a journey of life together. That's how it is. You are all friends. Generally, you are friends. But after this person takes this lady's hand and draws her, now it is between the two of them. The, the rest of the journey is between the two of them. Now they become closer than they are to every one of you. So, so God draws you like that and say, let's start this journey. I want to, I, it's going to lead somewhere. Let's go. So from there, then you go to the holy place. He draws you into deeper intimacy. Song of Songs chapter one, verse four. <laughs> you know, Song of Solomon is what Solomon wrote, but Song of Songs is what the Spirit wanted to teach through Solomon's writing. So the Bible says, Song of Solomon, Song of Songs. That's draw me. So, because this one was between Solomon and a black woman, their love affair. But it's a book that has the most intimate details, you know, even when it comes to sex and all that. But then, when it comes to our relationship with God, 
that book, no, no book comes close to Song of Songs. Draw me away. We will run after you. The king has brought me into his chambers. We will be glad and rejoice in you. We will remember your love more than wine. Rightly do they love you. He said, draw me away. When you draw me, then we will run after you. That's where ministry starts. Ministry does not start when you respond to the call. No. Ministry starts when he draws you to him. As he draws you, then we will follow you. So there's, a, there's always a drawing into intimacy. Now, the drawing is always a call to number one, come up. Exodus 24, 18. The man Moses. 24, 18. Uh, 24, 12, sorry. 24, 12. 24, 12 to 18. Yeah. Then the Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and be there. We can stop right here and I can just preach this whole message right here. Come up to me on the mountain and be there. Because along the line, God will test whether you are really, really, do you really want this? Do you really want me? That's why when you, when you start seeking God, he will not mind you. You, you, you will not feel anything. You will not sense anything. He will not mind you. Because he wants to test whether you are really serious. Whether you really want him. On the mountain and be there. And I will give you tablets of stone. You watch. And the law and the commandment which I have written that you may teach them. So Moses arose with his assistant Joshua. And Moses went up to the mountain of God. And he said to the elders... Wait here for us until we come back to you. Indeed, Aaron and her are with you. If any man has a difficulty, let him, let him go to them. This is very instructive. The same way Abraham told the servant, stay here with the donkeys, the lad and I will go yonder. Not many people will go that. If he, Moses went to Joshua, but it got to a point, Joshua had to stay, and Moses had to go up. Because it's messy with God. It's individual, not group. And Moses had learned how to leave the people to meet God. He learned that in the, in the wilderness. When he left the sheep to, to, to look at the burning bush. So if we, you don't learn to leave the people to, go, to meet God, you cannot help the people. You can be doing ministry, blessing people, touching people, preaching to people, and run out of gas and, and, and tend to burn out. Become depressed and all that. Why? Because you are only giving. You have not learned to sometimes leave them and go and be with him. That's, that's where we treat, we treat coming. Okay. Then Moses went up into the mountain and a cloud covered the mountain. Now the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. The sight of the glory of God was like consuming fire on the mountain in the eyes of the people of Israel. Okay, the last verse, 18. So Moses went into the midst of the cloud and went up onto the mountain. And Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. Do you know what caught my attention? God said, come and be there. Just be there. And he was there for seven days. Nothing. God didn't say anything. After seven days, then God said, come into the cloud. So it means that when he got to the mountain, he was doing what? Waiting. He was waiting. God had to invite him. It was God who said, come to me on the mountain. But said, and be there. Just be there. Be there. When I need you, then I'll call you. Be there. Just be there. That's why we can't, we can't stand sometimes. Some people can come to a ministry and then they, they feel like, oh, I'm not being given anything to do. 
oh yeah when i went there they didn't i didn't get anything to do so i just left no just be there be there the time will come where what what god wants to do it will manifest just be there Six, six days he was just there just waiting then the seventh day then god said come up come come here that instruction when god is drawing you it is come he said come in the morning then he says um come alone Exodus 34 verse 2 to 3 2 to 3 so be ready in the morning and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself to me there on the top of the mountain. And no man shall come up with you. You see? And let no man be seen throughout all the mountain. Let neither flocks nor heads feed before the mountain. No one come alone. So the time that you spend with God alone that is what builds intimacy. The key word is alone. That, that little word, alone. Alone. Let me shock you. Jesus never prayed with the disciples. He was always alone, praying somewhere. Then they will come and they will say, teach us to pray like you taught John. You will leave them, go to the mountains, stay there alone. Because that's when he that's when he was he was receiving instructions for the following day. Intimacy is not a group thing, it's, it's an individual thing. So come alone. The first test of intimacy, Exodus 16, verse 4. The first test of intimacy. So we've seen one word. One word is alone. Come alone. Now the next word. The Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day. That I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. The first test. Say, the test that I will know that you, you will walk with me is that come every day. Gather manna. So it's a, a loan and then a daily affair. Not ritual, not religion, but it's a daily thing. Paul said, I die daily. It's a daily affair. Not the ritual of taking the Bible and uh, maybe having the portion to read. That one is good. That one is good. In fact, without that one, you can't get to what, I, what I'm trying to say. But give us this day our daily bread. It's like, you hear from him in a significant way daily. You get the daily bread that he gives you. Your heart is in tune with him for your daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. It's a daily affair. Christianity is a daily affair. Daily affair. Leviticus 6 verse 12 to 13. Put wood on the fire every morning. That fire should not go out every morning. And the fire on the altar shall be kept burned on it. It shall not be put out. And the priest shall burn wood on it every morning. So the king priest, you must attend to the fire every day. Every day. Every morning, attend to the fire. Every day. Ten minutes a day is better than ten hours a month with God. Let me repeat. Ten minutes with God every day. Five minutes with God every day is better than ten hours every two weeks. Do you know why? Because intimacy is built on the consistency not necessarily the duration, the consistency, the frequency, the consistency. God has said that. You see, I taught this thing some time ago, and somebody told me that she practiced it, whether it was true. I said that if you tell God 
I'm going to meet you every day at 2 a.m. It's not, like, not God who told you. You say, I'm going to come and have fellowship with you every day at 2 a.m. By 1.50, he's there waiting for you. <laughs> he's there waiting for you. And so the consistency is very important. The reason why it's like we, because the consistency, we think that, oh, let me just spend 10 hours this end of this month and I've, I've, I'm done with, uh, with prayer. No. 10 minutes a day is better than 10 hours once a month. How many of you, when you marry, two things. Number one, you have a husband who takes you on a trip. Maybe there's a trip to buy, let you come. But in between, no, nothing. He doesn't appreciate you. He doesn't res really respect you. I mean, you are not anything. You are not, I mean, you're even you, you are not, you are, you are nothing. And then the one that will not take you on a trip to Dubai, but every day he's appreciating you, he's there for you, he's loving you. He, somebody say, Oh, he's <laughs> loving you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> hey, one day Carissa told me I'm not romantic. <laughs> Can you believe Carissa? <laughs> because she sent me a message and I replied, What did I say? I said, Oh, okay, we thank you. He said, Oh, no, that you, you must say, Ow. <laughs> okay, so how many of you will prefer this first one to this other one who comes out of the blue? Oh, let's go to Dubai. Then you are you go. Then you come back. Oh, shop everything. But he will leave you there. Don't don't pick your calls. You you wouldn't want that. So, oh, anybody here who wants that? No, I don't think so. So consistency is better than duration. And I've I realized that when you become consistent with anything, you do it over a period. You break into realms, no matter how little it is. If you do it consistently, consistently, you break into a realm. Because the spirit's realm, they open up to consistency. Spirits open up to consistency. If you like, take snap. Go and take a stone. Come there every day. Pour it. A spirit will respond. The spirit will respond when you see that you have been calling his name every day. You, are, you, you, mean, you mean business. Evil spirit is also respond to consistency. The Holy Spirit also responds to consistency. Not necessarily to duration. Okay. The second test of intimacy is that God hides himself from you. Isaiah 45, 15. It's a test. When you get to that point, know that it's a test. God hides himself from you. Truly you are God. You who hide yourself, O God of Israel, the Savior. Do you know why God hides himself from you? Because God wants to be pursued. He enjoys the chase. Do you know God enjoys the chase? Do you know it's like women enjoy the chase? It's a trick. It's a, it's a key I'm giving you. <laughs> you see, that's why, that's why, that's why, even when they see you, mm, they will pretend they have not seen you. They want you to call, call her. Yes. They, they, that's how God is. God enjoys the chase. So you must always be as if you are now chasing your wife. Yes. When you see that you are getting used to her, then you remember that, no, I have to do something as if I'm not chasing her. That's why we call it go back to your first love. When God draws you, 
He draws you and then he gives you a dose of himself. Listen, a dose of himself. It's called the, the foretaste. Then he starts running. Do you know why? Because God is very addictive. He is very addictive. His presence is addictive. When you encounter him, you want more of him. So he gives you an encounter or he gives you something of him that will make you pursue him that he takes off. That you see you run after him. At first, he was trying to woo you. He will, he will answer your prayers. Give you one testimony. Do this, do this. Then he will draw you. Then when you have tasted of him and you can't sit still, then you will start running. And then you are chasing him. You are, you are chasing him. You want more of him. That's why you, 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 David, David was like crazy. He said, even my flesh, my, my very flesh, yearns for you. Can you imagine? That I want God to touch my flesh. My flesh is like, it's a strong word. Like somebody saying that he, he's having an erection, something like that. Yeah. My soul longs for you. My flesh yearns for you. My flesh, my body. It means that there's something that he has seen about God that turns him on. He, he, he can't have enough of him. I must have it. That is what happens to you when God draws you, for instance, and puts something in your heart called ministry. People will never understand you. People will not understand you. Why you have a passion to pray intercede. It's almost like if you don't do it, you will die. It's almost like it's a burden. Why are you always you are always going to church, always going to this, always what is happening? People will not understand you. It's a fault. He has dropped something in you that is working you. That is God. Usually, when you start, what when you start with God, for instance, there are people that God will woo them to come to it, to work with him. He will have to woo them. He will woo them with this, with that. When he gets you in and he locks you, and you know that you have been the ship that brought you, you can't go back. <laughs> that is when he will say, okay, now, now this classes, classes time. <laughs> let's, let's, let's start the classes. So, when God chases you, when God runs, hides himself, sometimes when you are not hearing anything, take heart. Just check one or two things to make sure that you're in alignment. You are not hearing anything. You have prayed. There's no answer, no sign, nothing. It's like you are shut in. It is God's test of intimacy. Is this guy really serious with me? When you want to have an encounter, when you are praying, may God has drawn you, you are praying, you are praying, God will let you get to a place where you defy the flesh for him to know that you are serious. That's why usually you can pray and pray and pray and pray before you have an encounter or before you break through into some areas. Because the things of God, they are not for casual browsers. If you are a casual browser, there are aspects of God you will never know. That's why you can never, you can never grow just by being a Sunday worshiper. If this thing is not there, like, how many messages have you not heard? How many preachings have you not heard? You heard it only once. It, that won't let you grow. You must take the Bible. Take the word. Take the Bible. Feed yourself. If it's preaching, it will lead you back to the word. Do you know that what I've preached right now, you, when, you, when we leave, you forget about 90%. Naturally speaking, you will retain only 10. Even me, when I took the spirit of grace as application, I realized that the things I was about to share today were things I have shared in that message. I was like, and I, I didn't remember. I had, to, I had to be prompted to take that message and listen. That's why 
we can repeat many things. Do you know why? Because it, it takes more than just saying something once for people to get it. The same manner, every day, you can roast it, you can fry it, you can boil it, you can toast it, you can, um, you can bake it. The same manner. Okay. It's clear that I cannot finish. <laughs> but yeah, it's clear. So, but because I want to shame some people, I'm going to end now. I want to shame some people. Shame some people. <laughs> anyway, so, you know, Elijah asked Elisha, what have I done to you? In 1 Kings 19, when he threw the mantle on Eli Elisha, Elisha said, please, let me say goodbye to my parents. He said, go. What have I done to you? But he knew what he had done to him. He had disorganized him. <laughs> that mantle that came on him had disorganized him. The guy could not, he was restless. There's a point where even when God says, go, 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 you say, I won't go anywhere. Yes, there's a point that God, you see, Elijah intentionally decided to prevent Elisha from following him. The Lord has sent me to Bethel. Please stay here. I'll come back soon. He said, no, I'll go with you. So the point where they got to the point where it was, he knew that it was impossible to convince this man, Elisha. Then said, ask me, what do you want? That blank check is not given to you at the beginning of the journey. No. That blank check, ask me what you want. No, no. It's only given when you cross Jordan. It's only, oh. You see, and you know where Jordan is? Jordan is here. The, the, the veil. There were two rivers. There were two rivers they crossed. The Red Sea is this one. The entrance into the holy place. The wilderness. Jordan is the entrance into the, the promised land. That's why before you cross into the promised land, you must deal with the veil. That's the last, the last barrier that will break, that will break you through to that realm. Is the veil. That veil is the flesh. The flesh. There's a point you get to where do you know in the outer court is the realm of grace and mercy. This, this outer court place you are now gaining your feet. But there's a point you get to where this matter of flesh that we are talking about it's not, you know, the flesh the, the, the flesh has three apertures. Three openings. The flesh. One is called lust of the flesh. The other is called lust of the eyes. And the third one is called the pride of life. Lust of the flesh is worked on right be from the beginning of the, of the journey. He's working on lust of the flesh and all that. When you get to Jordan, what is worked on is the pride of life. Because the next phase, you are going to handle glory. And for glory, for you to handle glory, the flesh must die. Pride must die. You must, at that, at that point, God is training you to die to the applause of man. The condemnation of man. The desire for vain glory. You die to those things. You die to those things before you can handle the glory. If, if, you, if you are not dead to these things and God pushes you into the glory realm, it can kill you. That's why I tell you people that your, when, the way I see that you are ready for ministry, ready to be seen, is when you don't want to be seen. For as long as you are in the outer court where you want everyone to see you, you are just 
catching everyone's attention. You are, no, no, you are not there. You are not ready to handle the deep things of God. When God takes you to himself, he trains you to come to a place where you have only one audience. Himself. That's why in the Holy of Holies, the place was dark. There was no light. The whole place was dark. The only light was Shekinah glory. No physical light. Dark and you are there with God. He's training you how to have an audience of one. Because when you get to that place, that is when you, be, you attain oneness with God. You have an audience of one. You are moved only by one thing. The will of God. Jesus got to the realm of the veil, Jordan, in Gethsemane. In Gethsemane, what he was battling with was not lust of the flesh or lust of the eyes. No, no, no. He had, what, what he was battling at that time was how to get the will of God done. Whether to say, I will, like Satan. I will, like Adam. Or to say, not my will, but yours be done. It was an intense moment where he was, Jesus was really, Bible says his sweat was like blood. Because he was going through a lot. It was an intense battle. And if he had missed that, if he had missed that thing, all of us would have been doomed. And all the hosts of heaven, hosts of hell, held their breath, waiting to see what the Son of God would do. At that crucial moment, when he was going through agony of soul and spirit, and he said, not my will, but your will. That was when the battle was won. That was when the, the devil was crushed. Not on the cross. The devil was crushed in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in the garden of Gethsemane. When he said, I will, I, I will die. Not my will, but your will be done. Satan lost track of him. That, yeah, he lost the battle. This place is a place where you suffer to enter into glory. Now we're going to pray. Luke 24, 13 to 15. Okay, Luke 24, 13. Let me just touch on that. See, the rest, uh, you can, I'll, I'll give you the notes as usual. Now, Luke 13, Luke 24, 13. You know the story of the two men who were going toward Emmaus. Emmaus was seven miles from Jerusalem. And Jesus had risen from the dead and they didn't know. And they were going toward Emmaus. The word Emmaus. Emmaus means hot until sundown. Hot even at evening. It's a place of sustained hunger. Sustained passion. The Bible Towns and cities and names, they are not for decoration. They are part of the revelation. So they were going to Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. Yeah. What happened? Hey, it's only scriptures from Mark that he, she gets them very fast. Too. And they talked together of all these things which had happened when it's from other books. Bell will not get it fast. Unless it's from the book of Mark. So it was, while they conversed and reasoned, that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained, so that they did not know him. He didn't say they didn't see him. They saw him, but they didn't know him. They saw him. They were working with him. They were going to his mouth. I'm, I'm trying to let you know how sustained hunger is what will break us through into realms in work with God. They were going to his mouth and their eyes were restrained. They did not know him even though they saw him. Yes. And he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? And they didn't know him. And the one whose name was Clopas answered and said, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the thing which happened there in these days? And he said to them, what things? So they said to him, the things 
concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word. Okay, so let's go on. Let's, let's go on to, um, okay, so to 24. Let's see, 24 is there. God, I just want to get to that place. Okay. When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. They were just talking about the, the, the death of Jesus and all that and all that. Okay, so 24. Okay. And people said that they had seen Jesus like the men, the women said. Go on. Then he said to them, Oh, foolish ones, and slow of how to believe in all that the prophet has spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And begin at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now, so he's teaching them. Okay. Then they drew near to the village where they were going. And he indicated that he would have gone further. But they constrained him. Saying, abide with us for it is toward evening and the day is fast spent. And he went in to stay with them. This story teaches us many things. So, that it came to pass as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, blessed and broke it and gave to them. Then their eyes opened and they knew him. They didn't see him, they knew him. And he vanished from their sight. Now, look at what they, they said. And they said one to another, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us on the road? And while he opened the scriptures to us, you see, so they rose up that very hour and returned. We don't know what they were going to mouse to do. But after the encounter, they, they, they rose, I mean, they just got up right at that time and said, let's go back. We can't sit still. Do you know what happened? When they go to the place in Mount, which means hot until sundown, Jesus pretended that he was moving on. But the Bible says they constrained him because they were, they were hungry. They were not satisfied with having their hearts burning while he was exp- exp- explaining the scriptures. That what happened by the roadside. They were, their hearts were burning while he was preaching. Like you come to church, we are breaking the word and your heart is burning. You are shouting, preach, do this, do. That is not what builds intimacy. It is when they constrain him and then they sat with him and he broke the bread. That is when their eyes open. Let me tell you something. That, there's a place for that. But it was when he broke their bread, when he became their personal teacher. Not when the message was being preached along the way and our hearts were burning. They still did not know him. Their hearts were burning, but they didn't know him. Their eyes were still restrained. Their hearts were burning. Your heart can be burning in church. Your heart can be burning reading a book. You can read the book and you are child, you are inspired. You can listen to a message and you are child. Sometimes people think that that is, for instance, you read the book and then you are child. You think it's faith. That's not faith. That is inspired faith. When you sit down with the things you have read and you sit down alone and you begin to engage the teacher and he's breaking your bread, that is when true encounters take place. That's the, the place of true encounters. When he becomes your teacher, that is where your eyes open and then you know. There's, there's a realm you get to where you encounter him as the truth. Not just reading of books. I have read, I don't know how many books, maybe in their thousands. Read many books. Sat down many hours to be taught. Many, many hours to be taught. I've listened to many, many teachings. I've followed many men of God in ministry. Many of them, their teachings. Many of them have devoured their books. But I'm telling you, it got to a point. The Lord told me, He said, You have been riding on people's oil. Go for your own. That was when He began to draw me 
So now sit down. Let me open the scriptures up to you. That was where I had encountered the spirit of wisdom. The, the real spirit of wisdom, I saw him as light. Came to me. The Lord began to take me into deeper depths in his word. It's not just about reading. Those things are good. But I'm saying that that is not, for instance, you are not ready for ministry just because you've read Oe the Pope. You've read Rejoiner. Or you've read um, Miles Monroe. That does not make you ready for ministry. No. No, you must come to a place of encounter where he breaks your bread for you. Where he gives you your message. And then he says, go. Even the place of calling, when he says, come, it's not a place for ministry. It's just, it's just said, come. Come to me. Sit down with me. Let me show you what I want you in particular to do. And how I want you to do it. And then go. It's not a matter of, I, I've gotten some knowledge. Let me start something. No, you, you need to have an encounter with the word. An encounter with the spirit. I didn't get to the encounter. That is, that is the holy place. The table of show bread and the, 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 the seven candles. Encounter with the word. Encounter with the spirit. And then true ministry is, is birthed here in the altar of incense. That's where intercession starts. It, you, this, this place. Oh my God. This, this place of altar of incense. This is where something we call compassion is birth. Compassion. Do you know what compassion did for Jesus? All the miracles, everything, it was through compassion. Not sympathy. Sympathy is in the, in the soul. Compassion. Compassion is a, 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 it, it comes through the brokenness. When, when you have that encounter, this where compassion, conviction, and ministry flows from. Compassion, conviction, and ministry. If, if you have not encountered the word and encountered the spirit, and you have not encountered this compassion, you can't minister life, I'm telling you. You can't minister letter, but not life. To minister life, that's why sometimes God to push you to this place of encounter, sometimes she can just take you, turn you upside down like this and drain you of all that is not his. Your wrong assumptions, wrong motives, all those things will leave you. Then he'll put you up, down again. Then he says, now go. Let's be on our feet. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Moses was a man of hunger. If I got to a point, Moses said, if I found favor in your eyes, show me your glory. He said, show me your glory. He said, show me. God, Moses wanted to get to the glory. The only thing that limited Moses was dispensation. Because his realm had to end at the Jordan. He could not cross the Jordan because he was a lord. So dispensation limited him. But even in the limits of that dispensation, there was some hunger that could not be satisfied. No wonder when Christ came, and the glory was manifested. God allowed Moses to come and watch. And no wonder the songs he wrote, they are sung in heaven. So they sang the song of Moses and of the Lamb. Where he got to was a deep place with God. I want us to pray. This hunger I'm talking about is God giving. We can pray for hunger. We can pray that, oh God, may you give me a hunger for you. 
a hunger that will not be satisfied. You see, the hunger, the test of the earth, it doesn't matter how much rain the earth receives, it still receives. There's still more room. May we never get to a point where we think that we know enough of God. May we never get to a point where we think that we have arrived. May we never get to a, never get to a point where we think that we are okay. May our grasp always, always exceed our reach. May we always go beyond our present, what we know presently about God. May there be a desire in our heart to move further. A desire to know him. A desire to know him. A desire to get to a place of oneness. A desire to get to a place where we carry the burden of the Lord. We carry his yoke. A desire where we have an audience of one. A place where he becomes our only audience. Where our only motivation for things is the will of God. Where our only motivation is his glory. A place where it's not for our glory, but it's for his glory. It's not I kabod. It's not, it's not I. It's not I, but it's the kabod. It's the glory of God. A place where Paul would say, the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. He said, it's not that I that live, but Christ lives in me. But the life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. There's a place called Galatians 2.20. There's a place called witness. All on this journey. Where God can witness. God can say that. The Bible says Enoch received a testimony that he pleased God. Thank you Lord. Thank Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Most high of heavens. Most high rule of all the earth. Most high king of nations. Hallelujah. To God. Most high God of heaven, most high ruler of the earth, most high king of nations, Jesus. 
Thank you, Lord Jesus. Just, just tell him, Lord, I want to embark on this journey, oh God. Draw me, draw me. Draw me, Lord, deeper. Oni hatara mahala maho shalahela. Ebredeko mahala sundele mahari mrahano shalahe. Oni hatara mahara basa. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. Mm. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah to you. Hallelujah to you. Hallelujah to you. Hallelujah. Oh, yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 
Alléluia. Jesus, I want us to pray. I want us to tell the Lord, give me grace. I want to, I want to open up my heart for the workings of the spirit of grace and supplication. Let's pray in the name of Jesus. Mandara Macombre de Kimahala, Lebro do Site Brehengira, Vanta Pradi Coco, Silihata, On Tapalakitos, Macabalaha, In Calabakito, Silibaha Grabalam, Mantabalo, Catebro Dose, Andobre de Kita, Crampara Lido Stanley Brahaka, La Cobra La Kitoro Mahala. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We pray, O God, that this this prayer will not end here, but then our hearts and our spirits will cry out, will cry out, oh God, our heart and spirit will cry out for the workings of the spirit of grace and supplication that we will be taken from one level to the other, from dimension to dimension, from faith to faith, from grace to grace, from glory to glory, from strength to strength. Thank you, Lord, in the name of Jesus. We are praying this last prayer. We are praying for Ghana. Like we always do, let's pray for Ghana. We are praying that God will strengthen the soul of this nation, release prosperity, release peace, release development, release growth. Pray for wisdom for our leaders. Pray for light on the path of destiny of this nation. Pray for the pray for the uh, fulfillment of the prophetic word that God gave concerning Ghana. Let's pray. Let's pray. He said, "Ghana is my jewel. Ghana is my jewel." And I'll pour the prosperity anointing on Ghana because Ghana carries an apostolic commission. Ghana is apostolic. Ghana is firstborn. Ghana is the firstborn of Africa. Let's pray that Ghana will take her place among the table of nations as the firstborn of Africa, as a trailblazer, as a gateway to Africa. In the name of Jesus, we pray for our leaders that God will grant them light, that God will grant them light, that God will grant them light. In the name of Jesus, that direction will come, that help will come. In the name of Jesus, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you for today. We give you praise. We pray, oh God, that the same, the same hunger that you gave to people in the Bible, that same hunger baptized with that same hunger. The hunger that made Moses desire to see the glory. The hunger that made Enoch walk with you. The hunger that made David create that a tabernacle for the ark. That same hunger. Father, we pray for that same hunger. Take us on the journey of intimacy. Take us from level to level, from glory to glory, from grace to grace and strength to strength. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening to this message. We hope you were blessed. For more of this, download Apostle Joseph Minter app on Google Play Store and also available on all podcast platforms, Apple Podcast, Amazon Music, Spotify, and so many more. You can also visit our website, www.torchworldministries.com. Torch World Ministries, we reach, disciple, equip, and release. Be blessed.